The year is 2022. In a meta with Steve, Aegis, Kazia, and Rob running rampant, not a single soul could have anticipated Bayonetta of all characters, placing in the top three of not just one, but two totally different mages on the very same weekend. Lima surprised everyone with his incredible third place finish at Lost Tech City in San Antonio, Texas, earning himself a spot in the Panda Cup finale. All the way across the Atlantic Ocean, it was none other than Bloom Forever who won the coveted Vienna Challengers Arena 2022 in Austria. Thanks to her plethora of unique tools, freeform combo potential, and unconventional movement, Bayonetta is one of the most stylistic characters in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Her top-level representatives all widely differ in how they approach every aspect of the game, from how they approach, reset their combos, and pace their aggression. Today, we're going to dive into how two of Bayonetta's most dedicated specialists help push her to her best competitive weekend in Ultimate's history. In the post-lockdown era, Bayonetta has had a clear presence in the meta. It's entirely possible, even likely, that your local scene is devoid of the character at any level, but others were run by the Witch. Despite the fact that only 14 players won qualifying tournaments with her in 2022, Bayonetta notched 52 wins at locals of at least 50 or more players in 2021. Only Palutena, Wolf, Roy, Ness, and Rob scored more victories. So if these players are so successful at locals, why don't we see her more often at a major level? After all, she's ranked just 43rd in Easy Freezy's analysis of character placement percentages from PGRU Season 3. The answer is that Bayonetta is a character best wielded in the hands of specialists. Players like Bloom Forever and Lima, who have put hours upon hours into the character. Bayonetta's advantage state is unique capable of long attacking strings that look guaranteed, but are often dependent on layered DI and SDI reads. To take true advantage of such a character, you need to have a depth of knowledge, both of your own character and of the options your opponents have to throw a monkey wrench in your game plan. Bloom and Lima are both extremely effective in each of their playstyles, but their bayonetas are each quite unique. In this video, we'll analyze just a small piece of what makes each Bayonetta so successful. For Lima, we'll take a look at his incredible ability to take an opponent's game plan and wield it against them. Meanwhile, for Bloom, we'll analyze his ability to dissect what is usually the most effective counterplay to the Umbra Witch, mid-range shield camping, and turn it into a situation he can exploit. During his run at Lost Tech City, not only did he beat Nico, Lima ended up taking a set off of the one and only Meister. Compared to all the other Bayonettas, Lima's lethality is on another level. The key to his flashy strings and mind-bendingly hard reads is his incredible understanding of how to play around his opponent's spacing and habits. He will take even the strongest, most fundamental tool in your character's kit and find a way to use it against you. In the two games he faced off against Nico's Cloud in Winner's Quarters, if there was anything Lima kept in mind, it was Climb Hazard. Cloud's up special out of shield is notorious for being way too big, way too fast, and way too difficult to avoid. Lima took a button that was understandably at the center of Nico's game plan and repeatedly made him regret pressing it. In game one, a perfectly spaced back air baits out such an up special, giving Lima ample time to simply intercept Nico. This was a simple bait. But Lima's understanding of Cloud's game plan would show itself as the set continued. Climb Hazard doesn't even have to whiff for Lima to use it against its wielder. After hitting Lima's shield with forward air, Nico thought he had created enough pressure to safely swing with the stellar anti air that is Climb Hazard. Immediately after he jumped over Cloud's shield, Lima pressed down B. This is one of the most clear examples of Lima anticipating an option that, in most matchups and against most players, would be a smart option. Lo and behold, though, the up special came into fruition, triggered Witch Time, and allowed Lima to find a forward air into a charged forward smash. Nico's Sephiroth, although managing to earn a game, 
didn't fare much better against the menace that is Witch Time. Not just once, but twice did Lima succeed in maneuvering around Sephiroth's threat range, baiting out a forward air and landing Witch Time into some sort of kill conversion, whether a forward smash or a far more flashy double up air into back air combo. These forward airs from the corner are essential for Sephiroth to fight his way back onto the stage. To punish these absurdly disjointed and safe on shield moves is a feat in itself. So to take an entire stock for them twice is to flip the matchup upside down and on its head. Fish swim, squirrels climb trees, and Mr. Game & Watch lands with down air after a big. Lima's adaptation over the course of his winner's semi-set against Meister was nothing short of excellent. For most of the roster, finding an opening against Mr. Game & Watch, much less the world's best representative of the character, is an accomplishment. With good airspeed, lagless buttons, and an absurd option out of shield, getting anything more than one or two hits on him is a rare occurrence. This is especially effective against countering much of Bayonetta's combo game, where we see Meister take advantage of even a single loose frame to snatch away both the advantage and stock from Lima. If Bayonetta can't get her vertical combos for absurd damage and early kills off the top, then what is she left with? Well, Lima's read-heavy playstyle is especially effective in matchups like these, letting him find kills in unique and clever ways where the standard combos fail. During Game 3, Lima sits patiently in shield as Meister descends on top of him with neutral air and then back up with up B, which would have covered any antsy jumps from Lima. After having respected the neutral air and the up B, he was so confident in the idea that Meister would try to land with down air that he jumped after him and committed to an extremely telegraphed down B. All went according to plan for Lima, who followed up on his newly activated witch time with an up smash to earn himself the final stock of the game. Lima seems to exude confidence in just about every aspect of his gameplay. Here, after connecting a heel slide and quickly resetting onto the platform with a forward air, it's almost as though he saw into the future and knew exactly how Meister would like to recover. Recovering high with Mr. Game & Watch is extremely powerful, who is tied for the 9th best air acceleration and 18th best airspeed in the game. This means that not only can he cover a lot of horizontal distance quickly, but he can also swap between directions on the fly, making him especially slippery. Coupled with the threat of an ever so active and disjointed down air, to catch Mr. Game & Watch on his way back down is an extremely difficult task. However, none of this matters if you catch up to him before he begins his vicious descent. Lima was so ready for this as a recovery option that he went for a preemptive witch twist to position himself, recognized that he had correctly guessed the recovery route, and went for a second jump cancel witch twist to intercept him, converting it into the stock. Throughout Lost Tech City, Lima was faced with matchups where it's not enough to simply have a strong game plan yourself. Cloud and Mr. Game & Watch's strong out of shield options both demand heavy respect and can often feel unbeatable. But through Lima's deep understanding of how these options and how these players prefer to use them, Lima was able to embark on the best major run of his ultimate career and qualify for the Panda Cup finale in the process. Bloom's run at VCA was nothing short of excellent, most notably double eliminating the greatest warrior alive, Gluttony himself. Additionally, he 3-0'd Abadango, not with Bayonetta, but rather his pocket me brawler, known for its uh, heavy use of dash attacks and inspired lack of combos. Throughout Top 64, Bloom's Bayonetta bested brilliant players like Shanique and Modzai. Across all the sets where he played his main, Bloom consistently found openings for himself thanks to his safe pokes with down tilt and ambiguous options, tricking opponents into thinking they could punish him at a range where Bayonetta is often perceived as weak. So to speak, of Bayonetta counterplay is to avoid jumps and to often opt to just sit in shield at mid-range. Both variations of side B, heel slide and afterburner kick are the first options anyone must think of when keeping Bayonetta's win conditions in mind. In order to find new openings for himself until he conditions otherwise, Bloom smothers his opponents in close quarters combat with perfectly spaced down tilts and forward air pressure sequences. During his set against Shanique, 
Bloom uses down tilt as a quick option to stifle approaches. Spaced well, even fast out of shield options can't hit him, since Bayonetta's hurt box becomes very low to the ground. Bloom now opts to go for a rising forward air. The forward air is especially powerful, because he can buffer it after the down tilt to preemptively punish hasty jumps out of shield. Since he whiffed this one, he can time his fast fall in order to auto-cancel the landing lag and then buffer another down tilt. This one ends up connecting for Bloom, allowing him to get his advantage state started and some good damage onto the board. The risk versus reward in this entire interaction is heavily skewed in favor of Bloom. Sure, you can catch him in between attacks for maybe one or two hits at most, but if you overcommit and Bloom punishes you, he doesn't just punish you with one or two hits, he launches a devastating combo, because that's just what Bayonetta does best. Now, you would think that one solution to punishing a move that low profiles most attacks would be to find a way to jump in with a descending aerial. During winner's semi-finals, Gluttony puts just that to the test. Bloom goes for his classic down tilt, buffered forward air and down tilt sequence. Keep in mind though, that Bloom isn't in tunnel vision throughout this pressure. He's continuously checking his opponent's position, and when he notices Gluto jumping in on him, he shields the incoming neutral air just in time. The window between down tilt whiffing and being able to shield is extremely slim, making the move non-committal to throw out if spaced appropriately. Bayonetta's Witch Twist out of shield is a devastating tool to get hit by, and thus Gluttony takes a staggering 127.2% off of just one mistake. By jumping into his opponent's threat bubbles and whiffing safe moves, Bloom often tricks his foes into thinking they can punish him. Instead, they often just end up over committing and falling right into Bloom's combo starters. Here, Bloom jumps right in Wario's face, presses neutral air, and starts retreating with it. If Gluto had opted for an earlier jump attempt, he would have gotten hit with this rising neutral air, which can combo into an afterburner kick. Instead, after he whiffs down tilt, he thinks he'll be able to catch Bloom's landing, but ends up undershooting. Bloom was able to fast fall and auto cancel his neutral air right on time to catch this whiff button with a down tilt. The result? Another 126% being dealt onto Wario before neutral resets again. The result is a lush tree of options, a tree that Bloom understands intimately. Just as his opponents have entered a position that feels safe from the vicious juggles that define Bloom's gameplay, he puts them through the blender, forcing decisions that could send them right back into the airspace they're trying so desperately to avoid. Go through that blender often enough, and you might just decide it's time to try something else, to go back to the air or force your way back in. But that's exactly where Bloom wants you, and exactly how Bloom gets access to these big combo starters that litter his highlight reels. You wouldn't see moments like this, without Bloom's ability to pressure these opponents off the ground in the first place. This tree is just a small piece of the greater puzzle of what makes Bloom so effective, but it's illustrative of just how strong his handle of Bayonetta has become. Since Bloom's international emergence, the European scene has had plenty of time to make their adjustments and apply counterplay to Bloom's character, whose game plan is so unconventional that it's hard to apply typical fundamentals to the matchup. It's a testament to the depth of his neutral that, despite the target on his back and the fact that an entire continent now has reason to study his character, he continues to find new ways to open them up. Bayonetta's big weekend has started to push her up in the character rankings, provided by PG Stats contributor and Orion Rank founder Barnard's Loop. Bayonetta ranked 24th in the past update, which includes play through the Big House 10, and the performances from Lima and Bloom two weekends ago were a huge reason why. Bloom will get another chance to prove that the Bayonetta renaissance is real this weekend at the French Invitational Le Odyssey. Go ahead and click that subscribe button to keep it here with PG Stats as we recap that event and the Japanese tournament, Meisuma Top Number 10, next week.